Welcome to the next video in the evolution topic. This video will be looking at life on earth.8.4.2b. Point point Describe some of the paleontological and geological evidence that suggests when life originated on earth. So before we begin, let's have a look at what the difference is between these two terms, paleontological and geological. So hopefully they're not completely unfamiliar to you, but we're going to put them into a table just to summarize them so we have a good understanding before we go on. So let's start with paleontological evidence. So paleontology is a branch of science concerned with fossils of plants and animals. Fossils resembling spherical and filamentous prokaryotes in the form of cyanobacteria have been found in rocks that are estimated to be 3.5 billion years old. So that's a really good example of some paleontological evidence that has helped to uh, give us a bit of an idea of the origins of life on Earth. So fossils are extracted from the earth using a range of techniques before they're able to be analysed. So the removal of the fossils is done uh, by a group of paleontologists who then study the fossils. Uh, they usually extract them by creating an archaeological dig where the bones or the imprints, etc., are removed quite carefully to make sure that they're not damaged and they're able to be looked at. So... The difference between paleontological evidence and geological evidence, so geology is the branch of science that deals with the Earth's physical structure and substance, its history and the processes that act on it. So geology refers to actually looking at the Earth itself. What is what is it made up of? How is it put together? How did the Earth itself form? And what are the different processes, in particular, the movement of the tectonic plates as a result of convection currents? And then paleontology deals with the fossils that are found within the earth at some point. So banded iron formations, which we've already looked at in one of our other videos, are rocks that provide evidence of the change from an anoxic to an oxic atmosphere. So remember, we moved from an atmosphere that had no free oxygen to one that did. And rocks can be dated using a technique called radiometric dating, where they use different elements uh, to see how, sorry, to see the levels of different elements that are included in rocks in order to try to find out the age of them. So this little video talks about fossils. So what is a fossil? How are different fossils formed? And then we're going to watch a quick video on what radiometric dating is and how it is used to date particular things. Fossils are the stone remains of animals or plants that were once alive. Fossils can be the bones of a dead dinosaur or his big footprints in the sand. Usually, only the skeletons of animals are left after millions of years. But sometimes a whole animal, like a woolly mammoth, gets trapped in the ice. The ice stays frozen for thousands of years, and paleontologists are lucky to find a whole creature that has barely changed over time. Or an insect gets stuck in tree sap. The sap hardens into a hard, clear material called amber. These creatures look just the way they did when they first wandered into the sap millions of years ago. Let's look at the way dinosaur bone fossils are made. Most dinosaur fossils are formed by mold and cast. Imagine a stegosaurus drowns in a river and its body sinks to the bottom of the riverbed. The flesh of the animal rots away or is eaten by smaller creatures. Eventually, only the bones are left. Mud and sand, called sediment, cover the skeleton over many years. More layers of sediment fall on the skeleton. Over time, the floor of the river sinks from the weight of the sediment. The lower layers of soft mud and sand are pressed into hard rock. Now the skeleton is completely surrounded by compressed stone. The bone is slowly washed away by little trickles of water. This water is called groundwater. The bones leave an open space in the exact shape of the dinosaur skeleton. This open space is called a natural mold. Now the groundwater brings tiny pieces of rock into those empty spaces. After millions of years, these tiny rock pieces fill the mold. The rock is pressed further and further underground. Over time, the entire skeleton mold becomes solid rock. Many years later, the rock surrounding the skeleton rises to the Earth's surface. This can happen during an earthquake 
or as mountains rise naturally. The top layers of rock are worn away by wind and rain. Slowly, wind and rain show the fossils to the outside world. Not all fossils rise to the surface. Many times they remain under layers and layers of rock, and paleontologists have to dig a long time to find them. Okay, so on the next slide, when I bring it up, we have a video now that talks about what radiocarbon dating is, which is a form of uh, te a dating technique that is used to date rocks and fossils. How do we know how old something is? For people, we'd ask to see their birth certificate. For trees, we'd count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types of carbon atoms. Of course, every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon-12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-14 behave alike, but carbon-14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon-14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast, the amount of carbon-12 it has in its body will stay the same. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can measure how many thousands of years have passed since the animal died. Carbon dating works for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. For older fossils, scientists use unstable elements that have much longer half-lives. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Moyer. Okay. So from those two videos, we've seen what fossils are and one of the different techniques that are used to date fossils. So fossils are remains of long dead organisms that have escaped decay and after many years become part of the Earth's crust. A fossil may be the preserved remains of the organism itself, the impression of an organism in the sediment, such as a cast, or marks made during its lifetime, which are called trace fossils, such as footprints, for example. So for fossilization to occur, we need the organism to be buried quickly. So this stops um, the, the organism breaking down really quickly from the oxygen in the atmosphere. So if it's covered, oxygen and water can't get in, so stop it from breaking down. So fossilization does require the normal processes of decay to be pre, uh, permanently arrested, so it needs to be stopped. This can occur if the remains are isolated from the air or water and decomposing microbes are prevented from breaking them down. As we've said, fossils provide a record of the appearance and existence of organism from individual species to whole groups of species. Once this record is calibrated against a time scale using our dating techniques, such as the radiometric dating that we just talked about, it is possible to build up a picture of the evolutionary changes that have taken place over time. So with fossil formation, there's a number of different ways that fossils can form, which is what we're going to have a look at now. So one of the ways that fossils can form is in what we call tar pits. So animals fall into this tar pit. It's very black, dense, sticky, viscous material, and they become trapped. Because it is so thick, we don't have that air and water coming in, so the organism doesn't decay. Basically, it solidifies within the tar. We then have phosphate, phosphate, phosphatization, sorry, where bones and teeth are preserved in phosphate deposits. We have limestone. So calcium carbonate from the remains of marine plankton is deposited as sediment that traps the remains of other marine organisms. 
Pyridization, which is where iron pyrite replaces hard remains of dead organisms. Some organisms become trapped in amber, where um, so the amber is gum from conifers, which traps the insects, and then over time this hardens, and the whole organism is trapped inside and basically preserved automatically. And we have silic silicification, where silica from weathered volcanic ash is gradually incorporated into partially decayed wood, which is also known as petrification. So fossils have really helped to tell us a lot of things about organisms on Earth today. So one of those is what we call a transition fossil known as the Archaeopteryx. So the Archaeopteryx was a fossil that shows sort of the, the transition between reptiles and birds. So they were found at a time where reptiles were still very um, numerous, so there were still lots of reptiles roaming the Earth, but very few birds. So when they found these fossils, it, they believed that these showed the transition that said, right, reptiles came before the birds, and this is how we moved from one group into the new group of the birds. So as we can see, we can see that there's lots of similarities or lots of features from the two groups that you wouldn't find in each individual group today. Okay, so some of the ones, for example, obviously avian features where they have um, feathers attached to the forelimbs they have incomplete fusion of the lower leg bones which obviously helps them to um to be able to fly impressions of feathers attached to the tail we know that reptiles don't have feathers okay uh we have teeth in the socket of the jaw which is something that modern birds do not have they don't have um modern birds do not have teeth modern birds do not have a long bony tail obviously that would um, hinder their ability to be able to fly. So these fossils really helped to give scientists an idea of the evolutionary pathway from uh, starting off with simple organisms that lived in the water, then to fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, etc. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching.